You're listening to the Business Wealth Impact Podcast, your source for empowering information and cutting edge ideas from the world's top minds. I'm your host, Jean Amlor, founder of Seven Figure Coaching Company, Jean Amlor International. Join me on a journey to unleash your potential and create your highest success. Welcome to Business Wealth Impact. Hello, and welcome to the show. We have a very special guest again, Josh Rosenberg, who's been an entrepreneur since 2007. Now, Josh has generated over $100 million in revenue for numerous companies, and he is one of the top AI consultants in the country, and also he's global as well now. Welcome, Josh. Thank you very much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you here. So, you know, I want to start this off by hearing, because, you know, we love stories. I just want to start this off by, you know, asking you what's some story that you have from your business life that, that is amazing. Sure. Um, is there any particular kind of story you're looking for? Something that, that really uh, had a profound effect on you. Sure. So I would say that being able to do $100 million is no easy task. And that's for businesses that I've owned and scaled and sold as businesses I've worked for as consultant. And numerous years later, I was sitting there talking to somebody and they basically, you know, this was a colleague of mine. They basically had said that, you know, the secret to most people's success is being able to offer the right thing to the right person at the right time, present it in the exact right way. And I've heard that before a hundred times. I'm sure you have as well. Most business owners, and entrepreneurs have, but just something in the way that he had presented, that he said it just made me think a little differently. And of course, you know, we were sitting there on the couch having a couple of drinks. So that probably helped my mind to work a little differently. And I realized that part of the reason that I'd been very successful was exactly that. I had started out, you know, in high school when I, we were very, very poor, we were below poverty and I needed to help my mom pay some bills. And I knew that taking, you know, an after school job for a few hours at the Blockbuster just wasn't going to contribute anything. It really wasn't. And so I hustled in ways that weren't exactly legal. And I realized that, oh, at one point I was working at this cell phone store in the South Bronx in a really dangerous neighborhood. People were coming in, buying these very specific Nextel phones with a walkie talkie feature and paying with huge wads of cash. And I realized that guy's a drug dealer. He wants to make sure that his, he has privacy. So I created this fake technology where I took these little gold plated stickers that said that they increase your, your uh, cell phone reception, which they didn't. And I convinced them that these were chips that could block out the people from listening in on your calls. That was the exact right thing that that person wanted to hear. And I was charging, you know, the phone itself is about $800. I was charging another 600 on top of that. I probably could have doubled or tripled that. The price at that point didn't matter. And every single business I went into, this was the main focus. So when I owned um, an adult education company geared towards committed couples that have been together for 10 plus years, where there's really no more passion romance, I realized there's never really been that many or if any couples that split up and get a divorce after that long because they have a great sex life. That's always one of the first things to go. And then a lot of other problems come after that. And so this company, that was the entire focus. If we could reignite the spark in the bedroom for these couples, a lot of other problems can sort of work themselves out. And after a few thousand testimonials later, I was able to sell the company to an investor. And that was literally the secret sauce. Unfortunately, that investor took it and went in a completely different direction. And the company has been struggling, but that's his problem. Every single successful business owner that I've ever spoke to, they, you can call it luck. You can say, oh, this looks exactly like 10 other businesses. But the way that they present and position their product or service and who they're speaking to, it is so precise to that one person. They know exactly who their avatar is. And it's almost as if they get in that person's head. And this is who they're speaking to. And that has had such a profound effect on people's success, including my own, that it's like, I can't speak to somebody if they tell me that, you know, oh, we, we sell a product that everybody in the world could buy. Our target demographics are both men and women from 18 to 75 years old, all over the world of any income of any background. I, I've 
refuse to work with clients when they tell me that stuff before. Right. Okay. Well, there's so much there to unpack. First of all, it was good hearing about your criminal background in the South Bronx. <laughs> And I've been to the South Bronx and I was just telling a friend of mine the other day who lives in Harlem that when we were there, even in 2006, the police people on the streets were telling us like, why are you here? We were walking around looking at like real estate and they said, why are you here? Leave now. You know, so very, very interesting. It must have been really bad then. Okay. So you found out these drug dealers were going to believe that this chip actually made it have more privacy and that's what they wanted yeah. to hear and so that's why they paid so that's a really good analogy whether it's criminal or not <laughs> that it's about having people hear exactly what they're needing and that is not the whole world needs what i'm doing yeah yeah exactly yeah okay so now regarding your ai i mean fascinating you were telling me a story about how far ai ai has come so how are you applying this uh, you know, exact message to your avatar with your AI consulting. We just ran an experiment that concluded, what's today, Friday? It concluded on Wednesday. This was for a restaurant uh, down the block from me, very upscale place, very, you know, trendy, sexy place here in New York. It's, you're not going in there for fast, cheap food. It's, you know, you're spending $32 on just a burger or so. And like with all restaurants, their Mondays and Tuesdays are their dead nights compared to Thursday, Friday, Saturdays. They're not a place that's going to have a gimmick of, you know, half price appetizers or pub trivia or anything. And they shouldn't. Number one, that's not their market. But two, if customers know that on Mondays they can get drinks or apps or something half price, that's all they're going to come in for. And that's the only time they're going to be there. They'll be in there every single Monday but they're never going to pay full price. Same with reason that companies like Groupon failed. It's you're offering such a big discount that nobody's going to pay the full price. So we did something a little different. I sat there with the, the head chef because they open at five, but I usually go in around 4.30, have a drink and, and chat and stuff because I've known them for years. We were talking about how do we get more people in on Mondays and Tuesdays. So I asked them, you know, what are some dream foods using the exact things that you already have in the kitchen. I don't want any additional food costs, no spending extra money. What are some other meals you can make? And I also took out my phone and I took a picture of the um, menu and I loaded it up into um, an AI program. And we came up with a huge list of other foods that would be stuff that would match this cuisine, that would match this price point, that would match the demographic. And we decided, okay, here are the two that we're going to offer. But we're not just going to put them on the menu. We had images generated. Right there, are just loaded up a program called Leonardo, which generated images. We used the restaurant's background. So if you looked at it, you would recognize the brick wall, the bar back. You would recognize the countertops, all that. And it created a really good-looking vegan burger as well as a ceviche dish. And we put on social media, one of these two meals will be on the menu next Monday and Tuesday only. It will never be offered again. Which one do you want? Very limited quantities. And so we let that run for about a week and we got a couple hundred responses and the, uh, the vegan burger won. So we had it on the menu and from 5 PM when they opened to 8:30 when they generally get more business in the door. So that three and a half hours, they went from being pretty much empty to now being almost full. So the restaurant made something like an extra $4,000 wow. that night alone. Then that was, we did the same thing the next night on Tuesday where we offered the other meal. So the ceviche was offered on Tuesday. That was a total of around $8,000 that they otherwise wouldn't have had. That took me about five minutes to put together. They didn't have to do any extra work. I just did it all on my phone. It had zero extra cost to them. And now we realize it's so successful. And we have this huge list of new possible entrees that once a month we're going to do, we're calling it hashtag uh, mystery menu Mondays. Mm. And it's going to be, you know, the first or the second Monday of every month. That is so cool. That's sort of like the Costco treasure hunt, right? You know, when you go to Costco, mm -hmm. their whole yep. thing is you're going there and they'll have a product that they know, don't have always. And you know, you're going to find this product and it'll be selling for maybe a week or two, right? And that's yeah. a lot of Costco customers know about that treasure hunt that, 
what's going to be at Costco. Okay, that's that's fascinating. What are some ways that that an average person, well, nobody's average who's watching this, but somebody who's not paying your, you know, your consulting fees because they're a big company or, or a restaurant, but somebody that's just say an entrepreneur or anyone, what's your best tip or strategy for AI that you found or an app or something you just think is amazing that you want to share with everybody? Sure. So with every business, there's only a few different sectors you have dialed in. This is why your executive board, you've got the chief finance officer, technology, marketing, right? So you've got basically sales and marketing is one area. And that's almost like the lifeblood of any company because without that, you have no revenue coming in. So everything else dies if you don't have sales and marketing. Uh, then you've got your production, you've got your operations. So that includes how you just post that you're hiring. That's how you interview. That's once you've found the person you want to hire, your training, how you set your SOPs, your standard operating procedures, your, you define your KPIs, your key performance indicators, so they know what numbers they have to hit. You've got your finance side. Literally any of these can be dialed in a lot better. And the one that I have found that is the easiest that can be applied to anything is setting your standard operating procedures with the majority of companies they have a rock star executive team, the VP of this or that, or the department head here is fantastic at what they do, but the team underneath them, it's almost a crapshoot. Mm. It's almost like maybe you, you did a really good job and you hired someone that's fantastic. Maybe you're taking a chance on somebody that's a little bit more inexperienced because they see something in them, but the actual training process for most companies is really lacking. Mm. If you look at larger national chains, let's say like a, TGR Fridays, they may have you on a six or eight week training just to learn how to approach the customer, take the order, how to prepare certain things, what to do in case of conflict. They spend a lot of money making sure that everyone that they hire is really up to speed. Large corporate companies do this all the time. You cannot work for Apple, whether it's their mm -hmm. offices or at the retail store, unless you go through weeks and weeks and weeks of training. And that can cost tens of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. But the investment ends up becoming worth it because you find out who the employees are that are not going to work out. You can cut them before it costs you a lot more in the long run. But you also make sure that everybody is doing the great job and they're doing the work correctly the way you want them. Well, if you don't have a big company where you can, ex where you can spend that time, there's so much you can do with AI that basically does that part for you. Where you're having the AI, basically you're saying, hey, this is the job that I hired for. These are the tasks that are involved. This is the output that we're looking for. This is the way we want it done. Create a training module mm. for us. And we'll give you the script, which you can also either then record yourself as a video. You can have AI make the video for you and walk the employee through every single mm. step. You can have a great test so that they go through the training and then they prove that they actually paid attention. They know what they're doing. They can have written documentation. So now there's a whole binder that they can get, or a lot of people don't like to have physical binders. So you have a, a, a folder on your soft, on your server somewhere where it has all these PDFs that show you, oh, we hired you to do mm. X. Let's just say go, run Google ads. Here are how we want to approach it. This is how the headline should mm. be structured. This is how the body, These are the hashtags that we've vetted and decided are appropriate. These are hashtags absolutely never to mm. use. And so you can have full training and onboarding automated. So you, it doesn't matter that you don't have a business where you can spend another $30,000 training your new hires. Now you don't have to spend that money, but you can get the same results. Mm. Okay. So there are, I mean, most companies do have a, a lot of, not most, a lot of companies I know, cause I used to work with executives and, and who had companies, bigger companies, they do have training modules. Sometimes they do have somebody that's made a training program actually, but you're saying that this is going to create it way easier because you're, you're putting stuff. And so you don't have to have that cost of a producer coming in and making that like in the past. Yeah. I, I consulted with last year, a, a company that, you know, they're a $80 million a year mm -hmm. company. They have a large staff and they will spend 12 weeks training new employees mm -hmm. and it costs them between 30 and $50,000, depending on what the position is. And they'll have their HR team, somebody or two members of their HR team run through the live training, mm -hmm. almost as if you're going through, you know, a college course, which is great. But 
what happens when your business is a five or ten million dollar a year company? You don't have those people that you can have dedicated to just training. Mm. You don't have those expenses. You can actually have that same level of onboarding and training, setting your SOPs, defining your KPIs, all that done. I could sit there and I can create this entire thing for you in two days right. that normally would take 12 weeks. Absolutely. It's at least 12 weeks and they, then they forget stuff and then they, that's great. It's true. Most, most companies don't train well because it's almost like this. Um, and it's funny because I've seen this in small companies, large, medium, and you name it. It's almost like, okay, great. Mm. We chose our person and now just sort of like figure it out, you know, like here, here's some training. Here's some training and we don't really have time because as you said, they can't take somebody else unless they're actually a dedicated trainer. And that doesn't really exist except in, well, doesn't exist unless there was a huge company, but I'm guessing Amazon right. probably has something like that. They probably have a, a really, oh, you know, yeah, because they are a different kind of company, but um, yeah, if it's a publicly traded company, yeah. especially a household name, then yes, yeah, they're they going to have an do. intensive. And even then, even then, you know, they're not completely proper, properly trained because sometimes I will order something from Amazon and I'll order one and I'll get like a seven pack and I'll be like, well, they just gave me seven times the amount because you know that that person on the line picked the, uh, the, the bundled bundle and put it in my basket instead of unbundling and putting one. And I've seen this a few times, you know, like, okay, I, I, whenever I get that happen, I go, okay, I'm thinking, ah, oh, this person wasn't trained properly be in my favor that time. Right. And then there's, there's the other side, which is most companies that provide a service that they get paid on a net 30, 60, net 90, whatever it is, they're going to have upwards of 40% of all of the revenue is tied away in accounts receivable, meaning they're waiting to get paid. I worked with a, a very large law firm, 500 employees, and they had about 35% of their revenue tied away in accounts receivable for years. They had it on the books, they, they got the tax deduction, but they didn't even realize it. So now you're talking about 90 or $95 million that's owed to them that nobody was collecting on. Because they just didn't do the job, they just let it go? Yeah, they didn't realize. You know, oh, that client, they owe us $50,000 for work that we did before. Well, we could send collections after them, but Blah, blah, blah. But, you know, and it was just too intense. They didn't go after it. They also, it was like out of sight, out of mind. So going to. Right. That's so interesting. Yeah. And that happens so often in manufacturing and mm -hmm. construction, mm -hmm. anywhere where you do a job and get paid later. There's just, uh, I, there, I worked at a t shirt printing company that had over a million dollars in accounts receivable. Wow. And then they're. T-shirt right. printing. You know, it's interesting. I worked with a company, a construction company, actually an architectural firm, and they had the same thing going on. And I said, okay, we, we need to just like get on the same thing. Same deal. I said, well, let's look at your accounts receivable. And they're like, oh, well, I said, no, 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 no. You don't understand. I said, you're going after new business to get business that's also going to maybe pay a third and add to this problem. And all that energy of going getting, it's that new thing of the new sexy customer. And that happens in every single business I've seen. That happens with single coaches. That happens with mid people. That happens with million billion dollar companies. Not that I've worked with any billion dollar companies yeah. yet, but so, it's the same thing. It's like, no, let's just not. And it's astounding to me. So what we did was we called in all the accounts. We had the best month ever, <laughs> you know, best month ever. Nice customer service. Hey, you know, nicely. We've got to, you know, got to get this money in and then blah, blah, blah. And, you know, of course, we can't continue service without this being, oh, and then they're like, uh-oh, because some of them were current clients that were recurring. But part of that is a fear from the company that they, if they ask, that there'll be some repercussion. Have you noticed that? Yeah, that, that happens all the time. I know for myself with my own uh, consulting, I, I'm a little apprehensive too, like everybody is. It's, a, it's normal. But when I'm doing it for somebody else's, mm -hmm. it's almost like that, that scene in the movie Goodfellas, F you pay yeah. me. You know, um, and so what we did was we took their QuickBooks and we connected it to this AI finance software that acts as a collections agency. They send those sternly uh, worded mm -hmm. letters, they send the invoices, and then if there's, the bills still aren't satisfied, then they turn over to real collections that can, you know, threaten them with legal action. Mm. So the whole process took a few minutes. Sure. And how, tell me, how many people, like within a month, did you track? I'm sure you did. Within a month, how, mm -hmm. how much money came in from that. Oh, nearly. Half. So you got like 500, $450,000 came in. Yeah. For that t-shirt company. Yeah. Wow. Going to the larger firms, millions. Million, came in. Wow. 
So you literally, no wonder you made a hundred million dollars for people just with little tweaks. You know, little tweaks are so important. So Josh, I'm actually really fascinated now because we chatted a lot, but I never actually asked you this question. How did you get into this AI consulting? So I've been doing um, marketing in the direct response space since 2007, I obviously spoke about. And, you know, you always see these shiny objects. And about five years ago, people were starting to talk about AI. Mm. And it was almost like when you hear talk people talking about NFTs, only that I knew was just an absolute scam because... Mm-hmm. You know, who's going to spend mo- the amount of money for a picture of a of a chimpanzee that they would spend on buying a house? But <laughs> with this, I said, okay, there's going to be legs here. And I saw it very much like 3D printing. I said, consumers don't need to get it. There's going to be areas for industrial manufacturing, for construction, for demolition, for medical uses, that those are the real big uses. There's going to be humongous government contracts that are going to be given out and there's going to be a shitload of money in infrastructure that's going to be used in these new technologies, building houses with 3D printing. I, I knew something in me knew that AI was going to be right there side by side with 3D mm-hmm. printing. And I did not have the resources to go get into the, the 3D printing side, but I said, all right, I can absolutely do it in the AI. And I know sales and marketing being the lifeblood of any company, that's going to be one of the primary areas. And I know sales and marketing really, really mm. well. So that's where I started to spend my my attention. And so after I'm done working and I'm sitting there on the couch, I'm watching, I'm studying everything I can. I like never really turn my brain off to it. And in the beginning, it was absolute crap. It sucked. It was horrible. You know, you'd ask it to, to tell you, give you detailed instructions on how to make ice. <laughs> and just freezing water was too too advanced for it. But every few weeks, every six or eight weeks, there'd be an update that would come out and it would make little tweaks. Oh, after about six months, I looked back, I said, okay, well, what are all the giant, the little tweaks that happened in the six month period? I was, oh, there's actually a substantial difference. It's still pretty lousy as it is, but it really has come a long way. And then I'm studying and I'm realizing, oh, there's people putting real money behind this. There's investors, VCs, angels, there's large corporate donors that are getting behind this and every quarter their donation amount goes up. They're believing in it more and more Mm. and more. About two years ago, it started to get decent. Mm. And then in November of last year, when ChatGPT announced it was launching to the world, obviously that became the fastest growing app of all time. And you know, that's where people start to hear those words. I had been now in the trenches three and a half years doing this. And I was kind of engrossed with a number of companies that are at the forefront producing it. So I've been able to be part of the development stage on alpha or beta tester level and using it for use case scenarios, which helped, you know, with my clients, which then I would take back to the producers mm-hmm. of these, of the software, of the apps, and it would help shape the way that their software is being developed. Mm. I've been involved really in the trenches since day one. And it's amazing what's out there that nobody knows about, that nobody has heard of. That's where I kind of come in. Like what? So, and I mentioned this to you the last time we spoke, um, this hotel, about 200 um, room hotel in Tampa, where, you know, they're in the area, there are not too many food options that are not big corporates. And so people, just regular people that live in the area come to this the restaurant part of this hotel on a regular basis because they don't really feel like going to Chili's or, or one of those places. And they knew that their food costs were too high. They were about 34%, which for a restaurant is very, very high. We wanted to lower it down a bit. And I did my research. I found this company out of Great Britain that makes these cameras that stay in the kitchen. And so at the end of the week, Anytime the kitchen staff is throwing away food that doesn't get used, so it could be a protein, it could be salmon or, you know, vegetables or whatever, it's calculating how much is being wasted and then it reconfigures how much food you order from the supplier so that cuts down on waste. Mm -hmm. Well, their next generation cameras are going to be incredible because as the busboys bring in food from the tables, if you couldn't finish the whole plate and the busboys scraping into the garbage, their new generation of cameras will be able to calculate what's scraped away. Wow. So it can realize, oh, 92% of people don't eat the full burger. It's 16 ounces, we can lower it to 14 ounces. Mm-hmm. Oh, 78% don't finish their mashed potatoes or this side or that. We can lower the, the food portion size 
without people realizing it, charging the same amount, maybe we played it a little differently so that people don't realize the change, but we're going to be wasting less food. We're going to be spending less. Mm. So by doing that, we went from a 34% food cost down to a 26 to 27%. And at the scale they do, that's going to be over a million dollars a year. Huge. Right. We also realized, oh, the front desk staff is on the phones catering to people so many hours a day. People that want to reserve a room for these dates, but they have these issues. Mm -hmm. ODC wheelchair accessible. We don't want to be facing the street because mm -hmm. we don't want noise. We need a late check-in. We need blah, blah, blah. That takes hours. Well, we can do that with AI and you, the customer calling up the hotel, don't realize you're, you're not speaking to a person. Everything is taken in consideration. Mm -hmm. They know you have a peanut allergy, so they can adjust the menu on the fly. So the dates when you're staying there, the kitchen does not supply peanuts because just particles in the air can, can be True. really dangerous to you. If you put in certain information about yourself, such as your LinkedIn profile, the very first guest that we had they added their LinkedIn profile simply because we asked for it. We didn't tell them why, but it was able to figure out who this cus this mm -hmm. client is, who this person is. We real it realized immediately mm -hmm. they're an avid golfer. So waiting for them on their bed when they checked in was a little thank you note with a three pack wow. of golf balls with the hotel's logo printed on it. Do you have any idea how more how much more likely that customer is to to come back to that hotel and stay there again on their next trip? This is a corporate client, so they were there for uh, either a conference or visiting clients. So there's a chance they're coming back a few times a year. If we can get that person's business every single time, it's worth the 92 cents it costs us to produce those golf balls. Right, and I love your cat in the background. Oh yeah, he's, he's hanging out. <laughs> just, yeah. That's fascinating. No, that is an, a, a huge savings already. So this, so what you're saying is you've been a very early mm -hmm. adopter. So you've been able to watch it. That's fascinating. Okay, well, this has been really, interesting is there anything else that you'd like to share with people on a closing note really this is the fastest growing industry that we've had probably ever since the internet started and if all you you know is oh i've heard of chat gpt i tried using it once or twice i've tried mid journey to create art and that's where your your knowledge ends that's why you need to talk to somebody like me because there's so mm. much out there that you have no idea exists that I don't even know exists, mm. but I know how to find it. And it, and I can present all of these solutions to you that as soon as you hear them, you're, you're right. going to say, my God, hell yeah, I need that. That immediately realize how much extra revenue that can generate, how much overhead you will be able to save. And not only do you have very like no uh, downtime or slowdown in production, it speeds you up greatly that it almost becomes a no brainer for a lot of companies. So if you don't know what is possible, you need to get somebody that can figure out what's possible for your company. Right. Or you'll be at a disadvantage. But however, Josh, you don't like you were saying before, you're very specific in your avatar. So who do you specifically work with? For the past 17 years, I've worked with online businesses, so information products, SaaS companies, mm -hmm. uh, newly funded tech startups, uh, e-commerce companies. Those have been my mm -hmm. bread and butter for going on two decades. Um, lately, the last six months, I've mm -hmm. had a lot of success with hospitality companies. So hotels, restaurants, wineries, breweries, vineyards, anybody that's in the hospitality world, there's so many powerful solutions out there that you have no idea exist that that's where just coincidentally my, my careers or my clients have been all based. And so that's kind of where my career has been kind of changing direction a bit. Mm. Well, it sounds to me, and it's pretty evident that if people don't get on the AI train, they'll be at a disadvantage when their competitors are. Okay, Josh, this has been Absolutely. amazing. Josh, we are going to have all the links so people can reach you. So I'm guessing your email or your website, we'll get that in the show notes. So this has been amazing. I really, and very interesting. Uh, thank you so much for coming on and thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks for tuning into another episode of Business Wealth Impact. I hope you found today's conversation insightful and life-changing. If you want to support the show and stay up to date with all of our latest episodes, the easiest way to do that is by following us on your favorite podcast platform. Just hit that follow button to never miss an episode. And if you really love the show and want to help us spread the word, leave us a review 
and share the podcast with your friends. Again, be sure to subscribe and until next time, be impactful.